I wanted to share this thought and really emphasize the reality of this situation right now, right? Which is exactly what. I don't think Conor McGregor is ever going to come back. Ever. Uh, and if he does, it's not the kind of comeback that would be ideal. So, in other words, even if he was to come back, and let me be very clear, even if he was to come back, it would not feel like the comeback that we really needed or had wanted. In fact, it would have just seemed like you would have been better off riding out on the Dustin Poirier loss. Did he give a good account of himself in the last fight with Dustin Poirier where he broke his leg? He did. He was throwing the hook kicks. He had those same pattern of movements that he normally has with switching stances being elusive, sort of the ideal days of Ido Porto. You guys remember him, the coach of Conor McGregor, the movement coach to be exact. In fact, that particular style of fighting, he needed one coach to somehow uh, teach him how to move in a very elusive manner in a matter that is creative, in a matter that really will overload your opponent's central nervous system. Really, that's what Conor McGregor presented in his prime, especially in the Eddie Alvarez fight. Even worse, in the Jose Aldo fight where he knocked him out in 13 seconds. And let me explain to you the dynamic of that knockout. It was a combination of the pressure that Jose Aldo had to face, which was what? He had to face an entire Irish crowd that was against him in Las Vegas, and not only that, he had to face a guy that was talking all this smack and all of this buildup surrounding the whole entire event in which he had to deliver. And then when the bell rung, Connor was moving in and out, doing his stance switches, or not really, but then he was sort of looking to counter. Jose Aldo comes in aggressively because remember, he's the guy that is pressured into delivering against this ideal antagonist. And in our entire careers, especially in the era of Jose Aldo, his idea of a nemesis like that was unheard of. So for Conor McGregor to come, people in the culture of MMA at the time were really hoping for Jose Aldo to deliver and shut this guy up. Because he stood against everything that mixed martial arts at the time stood for, which really was a throwback to traditional martial arts. And in the same similar fashion, Chael Sonnen went and dissed Anderson Silva for bowing, saying, you don't come from a bowing culture. They would beat you over the head with your wallet and take it, or something to that effect. And I'm obviously paraphrasing Chael Sonnen's own words because Chael can express his own words uh, better than anyone can. And I certainly can't, but neither here or there. So... That's what Jose Aldo and Anderson Silva represented during that time, was champions about respect and integrity and respecting your opponent and all of that. But then there were people that were iconoclastic in that sense to where their entire prerogative was to be the antagonist all the way. Nate Diaz is a great example of that. In fact, that's the reason why Nate Diaz called out Conor McGregor and said, you're taking everything I've worked for. What does he mean by that? Meaning that you are taking my persona as this gangster dude in MMA. 
Because you gotta remember, if it wasn't for Nate Diaz or Conor McGregor, this entire game, I'm sorry to say, it, at least on the American side, would look like a bunch of dudes that train to Nickelback. And that's the reality of it. It's not exciting as gangsters. I'm telling you guys, this is the reality of why Conor McGregor is so popular is because of the fact that he is a gangster. And I'm not spilling any beans here, but the dude is connected with some real Irish mobster guys, okay? And, and that goes along with his wealth as well to sort of, uh, yeah, buy him into the organization, okay? Uh, the aspect of what we call in the West Coast gangland as you pay your way to stay. But that's neither here or there. That's that's one aspect of Connor's life. And guess what? He's got a lot of real beautiful things to look forward to, okay? He's got a yacht that's a Lamborghini. He's got all of these uh, luxury cars that he uh, drives around and things of that nature, right? He's got all of this wealth that he's accumulating from different business ventures. On top of that, he can draw a lot of money fighting. Although, yeah, uh, let's not speak on that, obviously, because then that's going into the subject of fighter pay. And being that Conor McGregor is the highest UFC fighter of all time, this also makes him the most brokest MMA fighter of all time, if you really think about it, because of the fact of the percentage that they take from him. Again, neither here or there should not be about that, but let's make it about this. Going back to Jose Aldo, okay, and those era of Anderson Silva, Leona Machida, and all of this respect stuff, especially with GSP. People were yearning for gangsters. People were yearning for real villains. Chael Sonnen played that role, Nate Diaz, and now Conor McGregor in his debut at UFC in 2013. So, this makes him a very exciting type of fighter. But not only that, he came and delivered because people did not like all of this extra confidence or all of this cockiness and what have you. People were not feeling that whatsoever. Well, why is that? I can tell you that, yes, it is the ethos of the traditional martial arts culture that was very prevalent at that time. But I can also tell you that a lot of people don't like it when other people step over the line or try to uh, steer away from the norm of the villagers, okay? And I'm speaking sociology right now so that you understand where I'm getting at with this, right? It's the village effect. In other words, you don't want to piss off anybody that's in your village because there are traditional customs in how things are done. Uh, and again, this has nothing to do with religion. This is more to do with uh, cultural sociology, okay? So it's more like there's a certain way that we walk, there's a certain way that we talk, and there's a certain way that we uh, greet each other. Uh, for example, here's a different cultural uh, norm, uh, and again, has nothing to do with religion, and I'm about to explain to you why. Um, when the shake holds the hand of Frank Warren and I think maybe even Eddie Hearn, right? And obviously, uh, I've had experience going to the Middle East several times where uh, people have tried to uh, hold my hand and I would say, listen, we don't do that. I understand that we're uh, brothers of the same religion, but understand that I come from an American culture where uh, masculinity uh, means something a little bit different than what masculinity would mean to you in terms of you holding another dude's hand, okay? But uh, you notice Canelo even mocked uh, the hand-holding thing with Oscar De La Hoya because of their 
current disagreements with some negotiations of certain fights that they're trying to make, especially with Terrence Crawford and the uh, money they're trying to offer Canelo. But that's, uh, yeah, neither here or there for another video. But understand this. Conor McGregor has a lot going on, right? Has a lot of money now and has accomplished all of the uh, championships that he's been yearning for and duplicated in the Cage Warriors days. He was a Cage Warriors champion at 145, 155. He came into the UFC and literally did the same thing. So he's already accomplished a lot. He's made a lot of money. Now he's into movies. It's very difficult for Conor McGregor to come back. All right, very difficult. Uh, what will he come back? In his mind, he's thinking to himself, he will. Why is he thinking that in his mind? You gotta understand this. Fighters are the most egotistical maniacs you've ever met in your whole entire lives. And sometimes not for a bad thing and sometimes not for a personality disorder, but just for the simple fact that they have a certain drive that will sometimes lead them to delusionality. Sometimes that delusionality is helpful. Getting you through, let's say, doing 20 rounds a session or something like that, right? I've done training sessions like that, doing 20 rounds, and let me tell you, the repetitions that you get out of that is just amazing and I think very beneficial, especially for a lot of uh, up-and-coming fighters, right? It's very beneficial. But that same drive and delusionality will also have you thinking in a way that Conor McGregor is thinking right now, hey, you know what? I'm still the baddest guy in the world. Okay, well, show me. How do you do that when you are drinking every day, uh, not training every day, not being in the gym? Maybe he is, but the extracurricular activities outside of that really is not helpful and really d more detrimental to his own health even outside of the ring. And again, here's another thing. He has his whole entire image wrapped up around being the guy that pushes alcohol. So everywhere he goes, he has to play that role. You ever had a friend that was the craziest guy in the group? Oh, Mike's crazy. He's going to do it. He's going to go jump that uh, pool because everybody else is scared to do so. He's going to go ring that doorbell when you guys were kids playing Ding Dong Ditch. And he's the one that's willing to do that and nobody else will. That's his identity. He's going to do it. Conor McGregor. What is he? He is a liquor man. And as a result of being a liquor man, he has to play up that role. And again, not very helpful to his career, is it? It's really not. So what's going to happen now? Is he going to come back? Sure. I'm not making this whole entire video out of this whole entire uh, just about under 14 minutes to tell you that he's never coming back. He is coming back at some point because again, what I just mentioned to you, the delusionality of this whole entire fiasco with Conor McGregor's uh, big fuss uh, of a comeback I think, I think that's going to drive him to do things that he uh, sort of overestimates himself to being able to do. So for sure he's going to come back. But the entire uh, thesis of this whole entire video is this. Will he come back in the same shape or in the same prime that he was when he fought Eddie Alvarez. 
And the answer is no. That's the reality of Conor McGregor today. He doesn't want to admit it because he has a very strong personality. And not only that, he has a strong belief in himself, which is what led him to becoming the double champ. So let's go back to that, right? As we are literally making this whole entire video sort of like a chronological biography of Conor McGregor. You go back to the Eddie Alvarez win. Biggest win of his career, still the biggest win till this date. The Donald Cerrone fight was a win as well, but in reality, it was nothing more than just a tune-up fight in order for Conor McGregor to uh, get his feet wet in the octagon. And then from there, he could have continued, but it was a pandemic and it affected his career and his mental health. God knows what he was doing during the pandemic when he had to stay inside and all the other extracurricular activities that he had to be a part of. So you got to take all of that into consideration. And not only that, the main thing that you've got to take into consideration is the actual drive of actually wanting to be in, the, in there. Now, let's go back to the basics of a person's uh, MMA journey. Way before the UFC, way before the fame, way before all of that. What is it really broken down to by the end of the day? You know what it is? It's you going to the gym hungry knowing that you got to win your next fight and there's really nothing all there is to it. Then all of a sudden you start getting wins, you start getting sponsorships, you start getting more money, you start gaining more fame, you start gaining more access to making life a whole lot easier, okay? And let's talk about that because this is really where this whole entire conversation uh, matters the most okay, is the comfortability of his life. Unfortunately, what you have to understand is that with comfortability comes access to losing a lot of hunger and easily chipping away at you from time in and time out. Why is that? Well, understand this, right? When life becomes a whole lot easier, you start losing the natural instincts that you would normally have out in the wild. In other words, if you see right here, right, I'm obviously out of park. There's some people out here with their house dogs. And look at it like this. At one point, dogs were wolves. There were wild packs of animals, coyotes, things of that nature. And all of a sudden, they became domesticated. They became domesticated for all of our safety. Keep that word in mind, safety, okay? But once they became domesticated, they lost all those instincts that they once had when they were out in the wild. And you know what's crazy about that? Most fighters literally go through all of that natural sequences of life. And it's a hard, a hard thing to admit. But at some point, you slow down. And you know what? I see this a lot with many of uh, my homies, guys that I knew that were about that life at some point, right? All of a sudden, when they started becoming career orientated or became more work orientated or got out of parole and lived a normal life and became a productive member of society and things of that nature, right? They slowly start to admit and say, you know what? I can't go out there and just randomly pull these licks that I used to do when I was younger. I can't just go out there and punch somebody out just because I, uh, I'm upset or angry. I can't operate that way anymore. And you know what? For people like that, I can understand and respect it, right? Uh, even, even for myself, look, 
I'll tell you right now, I live a great life. I couldn't ask for uh, anything else better. I'm very appreciative of it. But make no mistake, if you ever disrespect me in any kind of way, I would come and obliterate you in any way that I could absolutely do with whatever resources and whatever skills and whatever capabilities I have, I will inflict it upon you as a result of a reprisal. And that's just what it is, right? But still, there are some things that I'm not willing to do, okay? There's that, that, let's say that I would be willing to do when I was younger. Uh, for example, I used to dive cliffs uh, right up in Auburn. If you're out here in Northern California, in the Sacramento side, and you go way up north, there's a mountainous uh, waterfall area in Auburn a big cliff that you could jump. I don't know. It was probably like 40, 50 feet in the air or something like that. And you plunge down. It's, it hurts when you look, I just, I would never do that again. And you know what? I swam the American river when I was, I believe 22 years old. So that was around 2007, 2008 and I was swimming right across into the currents. Never again. Never will I do that again. So you know what? When it comes to reprisals or protecting myself, I'll come after you. No problem. But at the same time, when it comes to doing dangerous stunts like that, jumping off of a cliff and into a waterfall or something like that, or uh, swimming the American River or something to that effect no way never again never again but everything else it's always going to be there the competitive spirit the uh the protective nature um the aspect of knowing that you still got it in you right that's always going to be there but it doesn't mean that you're always going to be the same, right? You're going to have limits as your life gets better. You're going to have uh, reservations of doing certain things. Like now you realize, you know what? I can't just go out and give money to everyone, right? I can't just go out and say yes to everything. I can't just go out and say yes to every function or every event or every invitation you just start realizing that, you know what, there are limits to things that you are willing to do when you uh, get older. But that's literally just what we're witnessing out of Connor. And by the way, this is not to pick on him in any way. This is just really to talk about real life scenarios outside of the octagon and outside of the ring and outside of the circumference of a competitive uh, architecture, right? That's really what all this is, is to use the world of combat sports in order to convey the message of life. So that is all that I have for this particular content. Inshallah, like and subscribe. I will see you in the next one.